Welcome to the Power for Life. This broadcast brings to you a message of life-changing revival in the Holy Spirit. We pray that today's program will help to spur you on to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now here with today's message is Tom Hill. During recent studies, we've examined the children of Israel as they have moved from Egypt, where they were held captive as slaves for many years, on their way through the wilderness to the promised land. The land which God had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob before them, saying that he would bring them out of Egypt into their promised land. On the way, they are going through the wilderness and they experience many tests and trials along the way. And the scriptures use this time of testing and trial in the life of the children of Israel as an example for the church of Jesus Christ and uses it to admonish and to correct Christians, people who believe in Jesus Christ, people perhaps like you and like me who trust in the living God. And he uses their experiences as an example. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 11, that he uses, God uses, the experiences of the children of Israel as an example to admonish believers that we not walk as they walked, that we might avoid the pitfalls and the traps and the problems that they did, that we avoid the sin and the unbelief that they experienced and practiced, that instead we might not grieve the Spirit of God, that we might not quench Him, that we might not resist His works in our lives, that instead we might walk holy before God, that instead we might experience that fullness of the Spirit of God in our lives that changes us, that transforms us, that empowers us to live and walk as Christ commands and desires that we walk and live. And so we've been examining some of the occasions in the experience of the children of Israel. And today we come to another one. We find this one recorded in Exodus chapter 16. We find it's very similar in some respects. Oh, the circumstances might be just a little bit different. The test might be just slightly different. But underlying is the same kind of question that God presents to his people. You see, God will keep on presenting it until you finally obey. Or, as in the sad case of the children of Israel, that you rebel and you rebel and you rebel so many times that finally God withdraws his hand and he no longer deals with you as sons, and instead judges you, as he did the children of Israel. For we find, as we read through the whole account throughout the book of Exodus and Leviticus, we find that there was a whole generation of the children of Israel that did not reach the promised land. And the reason they didn't was because of their sin and their refusal to obey and to trust God. You see, he tested them over and over and over again, and they failed it over and over and over again. And finally, God said, that's it. I'm not going to test you anymore. And he destroyed them. You see, God calls for a change. And he calls for your obedience, and he calls for your faith and your trust. And he will not always test you. At the point that you obey and believe, you'll move on in your progress in your walk with the Lord. But until you do, he will continue the same test. Variety of means and ways, but he will continue to try and get you to obey him and to believe and to trust him. Until finally, perhaps, you may harden your heart, just like the children of Israel did. And where it is just like a heart of stone and where God will then leave you to your own destruction. Well, the children of Israel are given to us as an example that we not follow their example. That instead we yield to God. That we not grieve Him. That we not quench His work. That we not resist His work. But instead we would obey and trust that we might walk in a renewed life and fellowship 
with God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want us to look at another situation from the children of Israel. It's recorded in Exodus chapter 16. I won't read the whole example because it's rather lengthy on this occasion. I'll just read a first couple of verses and then I'll make reference to some of the other verses that occur in the chapter. But it's Exodus chapter 16. I'll read verses 2 and 3. And here's what we read. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill us with hunger. Well, on this occasion they're needing food. On prior occasions, we saw their need was water. On another occasion, we saw their need was deliverance from their enemies. This occasion, it's food. But it's the same underlying problem that we see repeated again and again now for the third time. On this occasion, we see that the children of Israel again murmur against God. And they complain about their circumstances and their distress and their need. We find here the description and the display by the children of Israel. The sin of tempting God. Tempting God. And today I want us to examine this sin. Because it's possible that you have fallen into the same trap that these children of Israel did. Tempting God. And I pray that the Spirit of God will use these truths in your life today to change you, to correct you, to transform you, to renew you, to reform your life, to revitalize it, to revive it, that you might walk in the freedom of God's truth, that you might be changed and transformed from this day forward forevermore. Let's now look at this sin as described for us in this passage in Exodus 16, where they murmured against God. There's no food. They've run out of food. When they came out of Egypt, they brought a certain supply of food with them. They've now used it all up. So now what do we do? They cry and complain and they murmur once again. Just in case you've tuned in new to our broadcast today and, and don't understand the word murmur, just let me briefly describe for you what it means. It means just to complain. To cry out to God and to, in this case, Moses and Aaron. But in reality, they were crying, complaining to God. God, why have you done this? Complaining about their circumstance and the place where they found themselves. So they murmur against God once again. We find that repeated throughout many in future studies that we'll have. We'll see them murmuring constantly against God. This occasion, it's for food. We've run out of food, now what do we do? They murmur to God and they complain. And in so doing, we see as we read their complaint against Moses and Aaron, we see inherent in that complaint and in that murmuring that in reality what they are displaying from their innermost being of their heart is they are tempting God. Now, before we get into it, I think we ought to have an understanding of what we mean by tempting God. Well, tempting is, comes from the word where you try something. Oftentimes in, in businesses, especially metals businesses, like where they use metals and they refine them. They try the metal. In other words, they, they take a sample of the metal and they test it to see if it's pure. And they continue to heat it until they've removed all of the dross and all of the impurities so that they have a pure metal with which to work. That's one kind of trying. That's not the kind of trying we see here. What we see here in the tempting and the trying of God by the children of Israel is that in essence what they are trying to do is they are trying to get God to change his plans. 
They're trying to get God to change his mind. God, don't deal with us like this. Do it this way. And the way that they want God to do it is a way in which it will satisfy their own desires and needs. They tempted God. And we see that as we read their complaint. It says, would to God that we had died in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here to die of hunger? Why didn't you just let us stay back there where we had plenty to eat? And then they describe some of the foods that they say that they had to eat while they were in Egypt. And in so doing, what they are doing is tempting God. God, why don't you do it another way? Don't do it your way. Do it my way. I confess to you, friends, I've said that more than once. And I rather imagine you have as well where the distress and the disturbances of life come upon us and sinful creatures that we are, we have the tendency to complain to God. And I know in my own grief that I have on more than one occasion been just like the children of Israel. God, why don't you do it a different way? In fact, why don't you do it my way? Oh, the sin of tempting God trying to get him to change his mind and to change his way of doing things. And we see that shown here by the children of Israel. Has that ever happened in your life? Were you like me and like the children of Israel have cried out to God, God, don't do it that way. Do it this way. And trying to get God to change his dealings with us. Dealings which, by the way, are shown in grace and mercy and love and compassion. Trying to get him instead to follow our own desires and pursuits. That's what the children of Israel did. They said, oh, that we would have died in Egypt. Now notice in this complaint several things. I want you to notice some things about their complaint that are not true. First of all, in their complaint, they forget what it was really like back in Egypt. You would think by the description that they gave in verse number 3 in their complaint that back in Egypt they had it pretty good. In fact, you would think that they had plenty of food, that they just kind of were sitting around enjoying themselves and there was food aplenty beside them. Wrong. You go back and you read the early part of the book of Exodus, you find a description there entirely different about the children of Israel. In fact, you find the children of Israel crying out to God for relief. God, relieve us from our burdens. We are under great distress at the hand of the Egyptians. God, deliver us. Times were not good. Times were severe. Babies and children that were born to, to uh, Israelite families were thrown into the river and killed. You wouldn't get that feeling from reading this description, would you? You see, in their sin of tempting God, they had completely forgotten what things were really like back in Egypt. Also, they had forgotten what God had done back in Egypt. On their behalf, on their behalf, God delivered them from their oppressors, brought them out with a mighty hand, the scriptures say, brought them out across the Red Sea on dry ground, destroyed the, the Egyptian enemies in the waters of the Red Sea, provided for them at Marah fresh, clean water for them to drink. Yes, God had done many great things on their behalf. And they completely forgot it. They failed to trust God and instead tempted Him by saying, God, do it differently. God, change the way you're doing things. Then we also notice that they had failed to remember what God was really like. They are acting here as though God were in fact a mean ogre, someone who was going to kill them and destroy them. 
contrary to his own promise. They had forgotten that God had shown to them abundant mercies, that God had shown them abundant provision on their behalf. They had forgotten that God had revealed himself into their presence visibly by a pillar of clouds by day and a fiery pillar of clouds at night and was with them constantly and protected them from their enemies. Oh, they had forgotten what God was really like. A God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of love, a God of compassion, a God of justice, yes, a God of judgment, yes. But they had completely forgotten all about the picture that God had revealed to them about himself. We find them tempting God because they had forgotten all of these truths that God had tried to reveal to them and show them about himself. I would pause here for just a moment. Is that true of you? Could it be possibly true today that you have forgotten what God has done for you? Could it be that you have forgotten the past from which God has brought you out? And you have sometimes longingly, like these people did, looked to the past and say, Oh boy, I wish it were like that again. And forgetting what it was really like. And how you had cried out to God in those circumstances that he might deliver you from them. And he did. And now you are perhaps in a time of difficulty and distress. Are you still trusting God? Or are you tempting him as the children of Israel did? Failing to remember what God had done on your behalf. Have you failed to believe and trust the God who has revealed himself to you in the scriptures and, and in his creation about his true nature and character? Have you failed to understand the mighty works that he's done on your behalf? Is it possible that you have fallen guilty to the exact same sin of the children of Israel where they tempted God? They failed to trust him. They failed to believe him. They failed to look truthfully upon the past and instead murmur out to God in complaint. Well, that's what the children of Israel did. And in so doing, they tempted God. They tried to get him to change his mind, tried to get him to change his manner of dealing with them, and in so doing showed their failure to trust and to believe. That is such an easy sin to fall into, is it not? It is so easy for us in our day and age to get caught up looking at the circumstances that are difficult and trying. I know people who are dealing with some great stress in their lives, dealing with great difficulty. And it's such an easy temptation to fall to the trap that these children of Israel did, where you begin to tempt God. And say, God, why are you dealing with me like you are? Why don't you treat me this way? Why don't you let me go back to the good old days? Sometimes I think the only thing that's true about the good old days is they were old. They weren't very good when we really stopped to think about them. There are things from which God has delivered us. Well... Have you fallen prey to tempting God just like the children of Israel did? Now notice what God did for them on their behalf. Verse number four says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather it every day, and they'll have it. Here is the first provision of manna. Manna was God's provision for the children of Israel when they cried out to him for help. Now here shows God's grace and his mercy. For here are a people who are complaining to God, tempting him. And yet in his mercy, he says, I'll provide you with food anyway. And so God provides manna for them. And that manna appears on the ground the morning of every day. 
six days a week. The seventh day, they were not to go out to collect it because there wouldn't be any manna there. On the sixth day, they were to collect enough to carry them not only for that day, but for the next day as well. For the seventh day was to be a day of rest and of Sabbath for the children of Israel. We find as we read through the rest of the chapter that even then once they saw the manna that God had provided for them, they still didn't believe him. Because there were many people who every day collected more than they needed for that day. And the next day when they got up, they found that God had destroyed that which they had tried to save. The scriptures tell us later on in chapter 16 that it says that it had worms and it stank. Sure doesn't sound very appealing to me. But they failed to believe God even when he provided them with food every day. And the scriptures tell us then at night that he brought quail. He brought food for them at night and food for them in the morning that they were to eat. And they still did not believe God. For we find as we read through the chapter, not only did they try to save food from day to day, but when it came to the seventh day, the day on which they were not to go out and collect food because it wouldn't be there, that it says there were many of them who went out to try and collect food because they had failed to believe God. And when they saw, got out there, there was no food to collect. Oh, my friends. Our hearts sometimes sure are hard, aren't they? Doesn't it sometimes seem like we never learn the lesson that God wants us to see? Even when he puts it right in front of our faces like he did them. On every day he put food right in front of them and every night he put food right in front of them and yet they still failed to believe him. Well, I don't know what's true in your life, but I know in mine too many times that's been true of me. Too many times I have failed to follow the warning that God gave in his word. Don't be like the children of Israel. And I've been just like them. For I have failed to trust God even when he has shown it to me day by day. And I rather suspect that that's true of you as well. Is it not? A failure to believe and to trust God day by day by day for the provision that he has promised to give us as his children. You see, when we fail to trust him, what we are doing is we are tempting God. Just like the children of Israel did in that day centuries ago. Well, what does the Spirit of God want these truths to accomplish in your life today? Well... He wants you to know the truth. He's given it for us here and he's told us in his word, study the example of the children of Israel and avoid it. Don't be like them. Learn from their sin. So he wants us to know the truth, that we might not fall into the same trap into which they fell. Secondly, he wants that truth to convict us, to point out areas in our lives where we are just like they are where we have tempted God, where we have failed to believe Him, where we have forgotten what God has done for us in the past, where we have looked only upon our circumstances of the present and have failed to trust the living God for today as He promised He would take care of us. Where has He pointed out areas in your life where you are just like the children of Israel? My friend, he has done that, that he might correct you. That he might change you from that. That he might open your eyes to see that you need to turn from that sin just like they needed to turn from their sin. They failed. What about you? Will you fail likewise? Or will you allow the Spirit of God to bring about a transformation in your life and correct you? Remove from you those offenses that grieve a holy God, that quench his work, that are in effect resisting his work in your life. He brings you the truth today that he might conform you to it, that you might learn from this example from the children of Israel, that you might avoid the practice of sin that they followed, 
that you might trust the living God, that you might not grieve his spirit, that you might not quench the work of the spirit of God. For we are told in Deuteronomy chapter 6, don't tempt the living God. We're told in the book of Ephesians not to grieve the Spirit of God. We're told in 1 Thessalonians, don't quench the Spirit of God. And we're told in the book of Acts, don't resist the Spirit of God. I pray that His Spirit today will bring about that transformation in your life that will renew you, perhaps regenerate you, revive you, transform your life today that will change it from this day forever forward.